Hi, welcome to this Code Rage 9 session covering new features in VCL applications development and how to modernize your VCL applications taking advantage of the latest XC7 features. I'm Marco Cantu, the Delphi and Rust Studio product manager at Embarcadero Technologies. This is my contact information. You can reach me by over email, Twitter, and the URL of my blog. So what's this session? The idea here is to discuss modernization of applications, understanding why it matters, looking at what's new in the VCL, and also covering features like styling, uh, operating system integration, and some of the new features that are available either directly in the VCL or indirectly through runtime library, database, and other areas. We'll also go through some of the porting and migration issues and opportunities that you have if you are sitting on uh, all VCL applications mainly meant for Windows XP or older versions of Windows. So why would we want to actually modernize an application? Why does this matter? Well, it does matter because the Microsoft user interface has been changing over time. Windows 7 is different from older versions, but even more, Windows 8 and from what we can understand the future Windows 10 are really focused on a slightly different UI approach, mostly based on what Microsoft called modern UI or originally was called Metro. That is uh, creating slightly bigger elements because of the higher resolution monitors, changing the style, using colors in a different way. And honestly, if you're running a very old a non-themed application on Windows 7, it looks a bit odd, but on Windows 8 and 10 would look even worse and kind of out of date. Now, the great point is that to bring this, your applications to what we can say the future or the current and future version of Windows, there isn't like a full rewrite to do with a new language, new tools. Mostly you are ready uh, you just need to clean them up a bit, uh, potentially add Unicode support, add styling, and provide proper styling support, and take advantage of the change to clean up the, the applications a little bit more, but there's not a rewrite. It's just a very generally smooth migration in terms of UI and styling. It might you might have a couple of roadblocks around Unicode and around 64-bit migration, but mostly the experiences of our customers moving over have been quite smooth. Now, another relevant piece of information is that Windows 10 is actually more desktop-centric than uh, older version of Windows are, and certainly it's not as strange looking or, or, or um, uh, upsetting, at least for a few customers, like Windows 8 has been. Although I honestly have to say that I tend to like Windows 8. But Windows 10 is different. Desktop is, again, the central metaphor. And so VCL applications actually are pretty smooth in running on Windows 10. Um, that doesn't mean that there is nothing to do. There is, as, as I was mentioning, styling, there are details like taskbar button management. There are important features that you have to make sure you support to be a good citizen of the new uh, operating system. And having said that, let me actually show you a VCL app running on Windows 10. This is Windows 10. As you can see from the new system menu, and is running Windows RT applications within Windows. It's running a VCL application that's properly styled, and this is just the desktop. This is fully integrated, and actually it's a demo of the uh, jump list. 
so you can actually have information that's dragged and added and integrated automatically into the um, into the system um, again full integration styling um, a rather nice look and feel that merges with the uh, operating system uh, style of course this is not perfect but that was meant for uh, windows 8 honestly it runs fine and provides a rather smooth view in windows 10 as well so the first actual feature i want to focus on is styling styling is a way to update the look and feel of your application to make it more modern uh, styling is based on the theme support that was added way back and allows you rather just to have a theme or look and feel that comes from the operating system to have a completely custom look and feel that you can add to your application. Now there is one specific extra feature in styling in X XC7 that is the support for a tablet style with larger elements and touch enabled style. But the other thing that was added in XC6 was the ability to um, style menus along with borders and all of the other elements of an application. This is an application that supports styling. So what the application does is um, it has uh, appearance options under the application sub item and has a few styles enabled and one by default. Let's actually pick a different one by um, default. Okay, so we can run the application and see it with the custom style. And all of the elements are styled, and this includes also the uh, drop, down, drop down menus since XC6. Now the application does a couple of more things. It grabs the uh, style names from the style manager and shows them in a uh, list box. And then when you double click on a list box item, it enables the specific style in the style uh, manager. So the net effect is you can grab the styles here, get back to standard windows, or pick one of the many uh, available styles of this application. So you can get a completely different look and feel and user interface, uh, including some very modern ones and a couple that are uh, honestly a bit, a bit awkward as well but this gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of the ui of your application and makes the application very modern without putting in a, a terrible effort considering this is still a vcl application with uh, themes support before we get into more technology there are a couple of more things i wanted to point out first is that Windows XP is really, even if slowly going away, this is some recent data of the different desktop operating system distributions. So Windows 7 is king. Windows 8 is not making much inroads, although it has become significant. But Windows XP is still out there, but decreasing month after month. So it will, and Vista is kind of negligible. So that's one shouldn't really bother you. Um, so targeting Windows 7 and Windows 8 uh, becomes a reasonable uh, business perspective, although may, maybe not for the pure consumer market. So as I was showing with this data, Windows XP is going away. Uh, Windows 7 installation are mostly 64-bit. That's another element to consider you might want, uh, alongside a migration and styling and other features, uh, move your applications to be a native 64-bit app. You won't gain much speed, but you will certainly gain from the ability to address a huge memory address space. Unicode enabling the application is relevant if you don't want to be stuck to one single country, one single language and alphabet. And it's kind of compulsory these days, honestly. Uh, database technologies you are using might not be from this century, but maybe from last century. And in that case, I would 
really recommend considering moving. There are specific sessions on moving database data from the BDE, so I'm not going to focus on that too much in this session. User account control compliance is quite embarrassing to see applications out there that still don't uh, get it right, but uh, we might spend a second uh, to mention a couple of issues. And the other thing I wanted to point out is you might want to take advantage of multi-core using plain threading or the new uh, parallel library that we have introduced in XC7. Again, why do we want to do it? Because, well, because our customers are moving. Um, customers are moving away from XP, have moved to uh, Windows 7. Most of the corporations have. And what you can do is actually go back to those customers and not just say, yes, my application runs, but say, yes, my application runs. Now you want to get like a nicer, smoother, more modern application. And with a limited investment of time and money, you can actually move to and take advantage of some of the newest features that uh, Delphi provides. Uh, again, in other application scenarios with other vendors, you have basically to trash your application and restart developing from scratch. We provide an extremely smooth migration from an uh, older version of our product to uh, the recent ones with advantages, with database access advantages, extra components, extra features. There are hundreds of new components um, if you're moving from a single digit version of, of Delphi. I mean, hundred new components for the VCL side of things, not considering even mobile and other great technologies that we are shipping. So again, what's new in the VCL? There are a couple of features that have been added in XC6 and XC7 around uh, taskbar buttons. One is the uh, taskbar component that offers preview and offers um, progress and the ability to also add button controls within the uh, preview window. This is a um, video player application that has a specific hook to the taskbar. So all I had to do is, was drop this taskbar component. And here I can set the various properties for the taskbar. For example, this has two taskbar buttons and the taskbar buttons are displayed on the frame of the taskbar and can be used to send back information to the uh, taskbar component itself to this on thumb button click uh, event handler. The other feature that I'm going to leverage is the progress bar by setting the values uh, dynamically. Uh, I do that within a timer uh, when the uh, media is being played, when the position is greater than zero, I change the progress state the max value and the progress value over time. So if we um, actually run this application, again, here we can see the taskbar with the extra items. Of course, they do nothing for now. First, we need to open a video and then we can start playing the video. And you can actually see how I can play and pause uh, the video. And also in, within the icon, I can see the progress and the position of the, um, uh, of the progress bar. So it's very simple, very smooth, uh, nice way to augment the uh, taskbar buttons of um, Windows application. This is how I manage the play and pause operation from the uh, thumb bar. Another demo that I want to show you is about the um, jump list. Now this is not as complete because to really handle the jump list you need to uh, do file processing. So determine what happens when you're executing a second instance of the same application. Anyway, this is a jump list component. It has some custom elements, a jump list collection with a few items that will just show up. And it has one category which is initially empty. So it has no sub items. Now what I'm doing here when I press this button is actually adding, creating, um, calling the add method for the uh, items of the uh, first category. 
So categories item zero is the first category. I'm adding a new item, uh, giving it a name and showing it in the uh, taskbar, in the jump list. So again, let's run this application and see what happens. Uh, here is my uh, jump list, control click, sample second, and I can add further item by clicking on the item. Now what happens is that when I select one of these, the same application is executed, passing the uh, actual value as comma line parameter. So you can go and handle the comma line parameter and display something specific, display the document or something specific within your application. If, if you want to handle a scenario where there's only one instance that received the information, then you have to create a singleton application, use a mutex or some other technology, and then use Windows messaging to inform the running instance that there is new information uh, available. I did that on a recent blog, uh, but the, that code was actually written in uh, Object Pascal. Um, so that's the core for the uh, jump list uh, management. So again, the taskbar preview we've seen earlier and the jump list that we have just looked into it's the uh, complementary because one is just the menu for the taskbar and the other is just for the taskbar itself and the preview and the extra information you can uh, put in your taskbar buttons. Another area that you can really benefit from is the inclusion of sensor components, uh, orientation, location and motion. Although honestly not all computers would have the required hardware to handle those. So that these are mostly meant for uh, Intel uh, tablet running Windows like the Microsoft Surface 3 Pro tablet that do have these sensors and have them enabled for uh, applications to more or less like it happens on uh, an iPad or, or Android device. There is Bluetooth support in XC7 both classic Bluetooth and Bluetooth LE, although this is not strictly a VCL technology, that's uh, something you can certainly benefit to integrate your application with others through up tethering or to uh, integrate with low energy Bluetooth devices through the new Bluetooth LE component. And so you can have your Windows VCL applications that interact with uh, external sources of uh, information and uh, small data nudges like most of the Bluetooth LE devices are. I mean, it could be watches, could be healthcare, fitness devices, and anything in that space. There are other features that are not so recent in the VCL that you might have missed from the ability to use a Direct2D canvas inside a form to replace the traditional uh, GDI canvas, uh, Windows imaging component support, into image for further type formats, ability to provide extra features for button edits, progress bars, and other core components, uh, task dialogues, support for gestures, support for touch. So there is really a lot that's been in the product for a few versions now, but honestly, um, I still find that a lot of the um, Rod Studio developers don't really know much about about this capability. The first of these applications I want to show you is a demo of using a D2D canvas. So what the application actually does is create um, an object of the T direct 2 d canvas class passing the uh, form handle as parameter. And then there is a bunch of code in the form paint that uh, creates a brush with gradient colors paints the background of the form with the brush and then writes out some text with a slightly different uh, gradient brush in the text itself. Um, it's not terribly trivial in terms of code, but um, it, it lets you do things that would be really extremely difficult to do with a standard uh, GDI painting. So here is our gradient with this round area. And then as you can see, the text is 
written with its own uh, gradient colors within the uh, within the text. So a rather complex scenario of painting with uh, gradient brushes, which again would be very difficult to achieve using a GDI, standard GDI application unless you process each pixel and that will become extremely slow compared to direct 2D. The next demo I want to show you is a simple taskbar demo um, that showcases how you can uh, take advantage of a task dialog with a progress bar. Now, similarly as the management of a progress bar, here I have a button that just enables a timer and then the timer goes through blocks of values and computes prime numbers and just displays the um, information of, and well, updates the progress bar and then displays the final information. So in a similar fashion, you can attach um, task dialog timer to the task dialog and write similar code that updates the uh, task dialog progress bar. So if we compile and run the application, we can see that this is the standard progress bar that goes through and you can cancel if you want to. And this is the do task operation that has a very similar effect. Again, you can also cancel it if you don't want to wait until the end and then you finally get the result, hopefully the same result. Um, so the idea is very simple, just taking advantage of this new user interface, very flexible, that's in the uh, task dialog component. Uh, available from, I think, Windows Vista onwards, but again, we should start getting a little less worried about um, Windows XP support going forward. Uh, the last demo of this group is just a very simple, uh, basically there is no code here, just some properties, there is some right aligned text, there is a hint, a text hint in this edit box, and this has the numbers only, sorry, uh, property turned on, and this has a special password character that you can just type into this, um, this value. So if we run this, we get a right aligned text, we get a hint that is displayed only when the element is empty and it has no focus. Here you can only type numbers and finally here whatever you type you just display the given password element. So having said this, having focused on new features of the VCL and some not so recent features you might have missed, Let's focus a little bit on porting and migration and some of the challenges around it. Uh, of course, Unicode is a challenge and an issue for existing applications, uh, but that's the way forward. Uh, we only support Unicode on mobile and the world has moved to it. Even Windows is cutting out some of the pre-Unicode support uh, going forward uh, and Microsoft is um, intention to and reduce the support for older uh, technologies in the operating system and in their uh, development tools as well. This is a simple Unicode demo. It has a list box with the text, what is Unicode in a bunch of different languages that's taken from the unicode.org uh, main website. Now what I'm going to show here is how simple it is to save this string list either in a Unicode file or a Unicode UTF-16 file or a UTF-8 file. For the latter, what I'm doing here is actually forcing an, an extra parameter uh, for a save to file, which is the encoding, T encoding UTF-8. That's a class property of the t-encoding class. Or the other way to do the same is actually to define a default encoding for the uh, list box items. So when you, have a, you want to save that string list, 
it's going to use the default encoding for the uh, file mapping. Um, that's the core idea. Uh, again, uh, there is full support for Unicode in the user interface, in the user interface components, in the Windows API calls mapping, and things are pretty smooth. So I'm saving and reloading the same file. So if there is any loss of information, I'll, I'll figure out. And the same, it works with the UTF-8 uh, encoding. Mm. There is a lot of information about migration. There are several white papers on, on the topic. Here, my goal was just to show how simple it is to actually do Unicode-based processing within a BCL application today. Fardac migration is another extremely important topic. Fardac is a library that will bring a lot of fun and, and, and powerful capabilities into database development. I would really recommend migrating from old Paradox D-based data, uh, also because we are really moving BDE off the product. Uh, the XC7 was the first version that doesn't ship with the BDE in the box, although it's available as a separate download for now. The other notable related feature is that IB Light, the Talia, Talia, qua. The version of Interbase that comes for desktop development and has only a couple of uh, limitations, not su no support for encryption and uh, limit in the file size. IB Light, I was saying, is now free in XC7, so you can migrate your application data and your application components from the Paradox DBase BDE to IB Light Firedock or any other combination of data access and data storage technologies. There was one specific session on that topic, so I don't really want to focus too much on it, but I really recommend uh, to try to avoid uh, using some of these old technologies in your current applications. When you're moving to 64-bit version of Windows and moving to new version of Windows, you will see hiccups if you keep using some of these older technologies. Of course, the full power of Firedock comes in, in client server. The number of features that Firedock has is really worth migrating from not just the BDE, but even um, DB Express or other, or Ax DB Go Access or other third party or other third parties components you might be using. Visual Live Bindings is also a feature that was introduced mostly for FireMonkey development where there are no data aware controls, but also allows you to take advantage of the mapping objects to um, visual controls, uh, mapping objects data to visual controls in ways that uh, data awareness doesn't fully uh, support. Uh, a good example is the mapping of data to a uh, list view. Another great technology that you can leverage is uptethering. Uh, uptethering is extremely powerful. It was introduced in XC6 and it has been expanded in XC7 to cover Bluetooth and some more uh, Wi-Fi scenarios. It can be used to easily expand your existing Windows applications to mobile devices. And it's actually a great reason to migrate your applications because this additional mobile companion apps can really become a big reason for your customers to buy an upgraded version of your application. So something that you'll directly benefit from. You can very easily provide new features in terms of mobile enablement through companion apps that will, for example, be used as a remote control or be able to use to leverage the device capabilities like the camera, barcode, um, recognition or any other mobile feature and use that feature to provide input to the uh, good old VCL application running on uh, Windows. I really recommend looking at some of the demos we have, like the photo wall demo that's part of the uh, XC7 uh, samples. User access control is probably worth a lot of time. And I, there are still applications that don't treat the applications folders as read only, try to write on them 
or don't save documents and settings where the Windows operating system expects them, I fully encourage you to take all of the effort that's required to make your application UAC enabled and aware. Or you will always get into some uh, small uh, troubles. Despite the effort from Windows to be compatible in that area, uh, you really need to make sure that your applications are uh, up to date. Notice, by the way, that the behavior that applications have uh, in terms of user ac access control really depends on uh, if the applications are or are not styled. So if they are old or new applications. For non-styled, non-themed applications, um, Windows provides some extra backwards compatibility tricks that actually end up being worse than the scenario because your files saved to program files, saved to the current folder, are actually saved on some virtual storage that's hard for your customers to find out. A couple of more things I wanted to mention is the fact we have a new REST client components library that's very nice and smooth. Um, it has actually plenty of features that would take a full session to demonstrate. Uh, JSON formatting, JSON parsing, prototyping capabilities, authentication. Um, another feature we have added in XC7 is the parallel programming library. And you've probably seen demos of how this can be used to leverage multi-core CPUs. Windows desktop applications are here to stay. Despite the enormous growth on mobile, most business still rely on Windows as the core operating system for running their business apps. Embrace mobile and extend your applications to mobile rather than do a full replacement, which in some cases might make sense, but only in some limited scenarios. Support Windows tablets with the VCL. The Surface 3 is a good VCL um, target as, as much as Windows 10 will be a great platform for VCL applications going forward. And that's all I wanted to say. So let's open up for questions uh, here at CodeRage 9. Thanks. Uh, Gregor asked a question, is IB Lite free for desktop? So IB Lite is available for iOS, Android, Windows, and OS 10, And it is free to deploy. Uh, it can use one core, uh, can have one simultaneous user and transaction and one connection per user. So it's meant for accessing and manipulating ANSI SQL statements and functionality with the local IB Lite database. It's the same format as the server, so you can take an IB file, and same metadata, and use it across all the platforms and all the versions, whether it's IB Lite, IB to go, the desktop or server. Uh, it's limited to 100 megabytes in size per database and, and doesn't have encryption, but then you can easily upgrade by use, getting licenses to interface to go which would give you uh, encryption at the database uh, and table and column level. So uh, lots of functionality and you can be using it and then move up. So Gregor, yes, IB Lite is free for uh, desktop systems and mobile systems. Let's see, Steven's asking, what's the advantage of Rad Studio over CBuilder Pro? Rad Studio Pro includes mobile support, the mobile add-on pack. If you have CBuilder Pro and you want to do mobile, then you need to purchase the mobile add-on pack. Uh, Rad Studio has the Delphi and C++ language personalities and compilers in them, C++ Builder. Uh, is for doing C++ development. As far as they s frameworks, they both support VCL and FMX, uh, FireMonkey. So you can do all those kinds of projects. And at the pro level, again, you can access local databases like Interbase Local and IB Lite Desktop uh, using the FireDAC set of components. Uh, James, you're asking, is there a summary of changes we need to make for UAC compliance? I need to look uh, at the doc wiki. Let me see if I can find. Um, I don't remember a specific UAC. I mean, there's certain rules you have to provide, like don't have your applications writing to the root folders or 
changing things in program files and so on. Let me go to DocWiki XA7. So that's docwiki.amarketo.com. And let me uh, get the XE7 and put UAC in the search box and see what I find. Uh, let's see. XE3. Now, most of that has to do with installation. Uh, there's just some guidance like uh, you can't debug programs called setup, update, or install inside of the IDE unless you do some special settings. Uh, as far as the rest of that, I, I would look to Microsoft's guidance for what you might want to do. But I'll, I'll talk with Marco. He's, he's in the other room uh, right now as well with the Object Pascal language session. So um, can I be like be compared to Firebird Embedded? Ludo, I don't know much about Firebird Embedded. That'd probably be a good question to ask during the Interbase keynote on Thursday. Uh, that there's two times, one in the Object Pascal track and the C++ track, where the members of the Interbase team and Stephen Ball, the product manager for, for Interbase, might be able to answer some questions uh, in that respect. So I don't know of any comparison that we've done specifically, and I haven't looked at what's in Firebird Embedded. Again, Interbase in general is an embeddable database. It's a install, deploy, embed, and forget about um, IB Lite is a is a DLL. Oh, sorry, IB Lite is a static library that you can link in. Uh, Interbase to Go is a static library on mobile that gets linked into your app, and on desktops and server systems, it's a DLL or Dilib. And then there's the desktop and and uh, Interbase server editions that run on server runs on Linux and Mac OS X and Windows Server and, and elsewhere. Um, but I'll, I'll pass that along to Stephen Ball and the team for their session uh, to see what they might say about any Firebird comparisons. Uh, with FireDAC, we have drivers for both Firebird and Interbase. And again, with Interbase, it's Interbase Lite, Interbase to go, uh, Interbase Desktop, and Interbase Server using the same set of components. Uh, the usual comparisons with IB Lite are to SQLite, which is not com complete ANSI SQL 92 uh, and has locking of the database, not necessarily locking uh, at multiple levels. Let's see. Are FireDAC access objects, FD query, and so on, using threaded access to the database by nature? Do I have to do that yourself? Um, that would be a good question for Dimitri. My understanding is that they're not doing threaded access to the database, but that you can use them in threaded-based applications. Uh, they do have things like connections and connection pools and so on, and it can be activated and deactivated. Uh, Dimitri is doing a talk on FireDAC, what's new, and tips and tricks. Uh, FireDAC News, which is tomorrow, Wednesday, at 1 p.m. Pacific time here in the C++ track. And then he's also doing it in the Pascal track, so you can check that schedule in case you can't make the 1 o'clock Pacific time. Dimitri is the architect and creator of FireDAC and any DAC before it, when we before we acquired the technology. He's been a tech partner for a long time. Okay, it mentions Luda saying in one of the last slides, when it was talking about the parallel library, which you can use in your VCL apps and console applications. Uh, mentioned tasks and futures. Uh, and again, the par there he's referring to the parallel programming library that is new in XE7, which is different from uh, C++ standard parallel features. Uh, I did a session at 5 a.m. this morning on how to use the parallel programming library um, with uh, C++ Builder XZ7, Rad Studio XZ7. And there's also a session over the Object Pascal that was today by Danny Wind, same thing, same topic, some different samples. So you can watch that replay when we have the replays, Ludo, about the PPL or par programming, parallel programming library. 
Uh, there's also a session tomorrow uh, where Alan Bauer, who's the chief scientist here at at Embarcadero, he created, implemented the parallel programming library, and it works for Pascal and C++ in Delphi and C++ Builder. Uh, Alan is doing a session tomorrow at 5 p.m. in the C++ track, Parallel Programming Library Architecture. He goes into the details of implementation and and under the covers and, and what's going on. And he's also doing the same talk uh, at another time in the Pascal track. It'll be, it's the same presentation. It's, it's pretty language agnostic. But uh, my replay will be up in the next week or so. Um, and again, it it's using the the Embarcadero Parallel Programming Library. It's not a mapping to anything related to Parallel in C++. Uh, okay. James asks, is asking about REST components and OAuth. Uh, for that, we've done a lot of REST bits. Uh, Jim Tierney is giving a talk tomorrow on EMS, the Enterprise Mobility Services in authentication and authorization. Under the covers, it's using REST completely, so you can ask him questions. Uh, if you go back to our RAD in Action series, back in November of 2013, there's a whole session about the REST client library components, including coverage of authorization, authentication. Uh, I think the OAuth2 example was connecting into Facebook, this REST interface. So search RAD in action, and then go look at the November 2013 replay. It was done by the Delphi experts, the developer experts uh, from Germany. They did a whole one hour and, and, and X number of minutes. We also had skill sprints about REST, and you can find those. And I've done, I did a backend as a service REST webinar earlier this year. So James, I'll, I'll get your email address from the registration and send you some links. Or you can just search for REST and backend as a service or, or take a look at the REST client library components in the documentation. Um, we've got that whole set of components for doing connection, request, response, mapping the JSON response to a, to a data set in memory or in the user interface of your app. And part of those components are also the authentication, including OAuth2. Okay. All right. Oh, Brian's just saying, yeah, looking like the sessions. It's like the Borkon. Yeah, this is our online version. This is the ninth, uh, ninth edition of these, and there's always more to come. We have all the back sessions from previous Code Rages and Mobile Days and, and such for people. Those are linked. The most recent one's off the Code Rage landing page on the right-hand side. You can go navigate to past sessions as well. So we're uh, we're happy to do this. This time we're doing uh, 14 sessions a day, so 42 C++ sessions over the three days. Uh, some of them more generic across the tracks. But it's fun to do, but also it's a lot of work. And But it's always great to, to see your name, Brian. Uh, and uh, I know someone is coming to the Houston area to do an XE7 uh, event sometime in early December. So uh, stay tuned to our events calendar. There's World Tour XE7 happening all over the world in November and December. Uh, I'm doing California. They're being nice to me uh, in December. I'm going to end up in, in Silicon Valley and then Irvine and Pasadena area. So, uh, But uh, someone's coming to Houston again. Uh, I think it may be Jim McKeith or Craig. I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, other questions about VCL or modernization? Uh, the other thing is you can send me an email, david I at embarcadero.com. Uh, if you need help migrating an older C++ builder application, you need to move it forward using new components. Um, I'm trying to think about maybe a workshop taking a real-world application. I have some older VCL apps and migrating them forward, you know, the BDE to FireDAC, moving across the Unicode chasm as it relates to the VCL. I know that the 
challenge for some people is getting updated versions of third-party components that you have. And part of that is the reason why we, we did some work with community members. A bunch of developers were using the old Turbo Power VCL controls like Turbo Async Pro and, and other things. And so we have XZ7 versions of those for, for Delphi and for C++ Builder now uh, that's, that are available. And I think Marco did a blog and I did a blog about where to grab those. But if you just look for Turbo Power Components XZ7, you'll find uh, updated repositories out there. Uh, but if you have other third-party components that are blocking you from moving forward that aren't on XZ7, we're here to help those companies, those technology partners or library vendors to help move their components forward. Um, and the R&D team continues to fix bugs in, in, you know, that have been reported from older versions in the latest versions. I know in the last two releases, there were uh, VCL and RTL bugs from past releases that were fixed in XE7. So we're trying to do not only any new functionality improvements and quality enhancements, but they're going back and catching up on the backlog of some other ones. Let's see, is Embarcados providing VCL and FMX? Will these be available together for a long time? Or do you eventually plan to only support FMX? So Ludo, we plan to support VCL and FMX for years to come, as long as there's a Windows, as long as there's a Windows API that we can access, the VCL will stay tightly connected and add functionality like the jump list and the task uh, test bar that we added in XE6 and the jump list we added in XE7. Uh, we're working to have updates of the latest header files for 8.0 and 8.1. So there's more that's going on. And then also, as Marco showed, and most of us now have uh, a VM or an, a separate machine with Windows 10 Preview, and we still have our very strong relationship to, to Microsoft at the systems level and in the developer level, uh, even though we compete sometimes on the Windows side. Uh, let's see, for new development, do you recommend FMX? It depends. If you believe that an application you're gonna build, Stephen, wants to be multi-device, multi-platform, then new development start with FMX. If you're building an application that's never gonna be multi-device, uh, maybe just only for Windows, then it's your choice. You could do an FMX on Windows, or you could do a VCL app. If it was me, I never know that I, or I won't know that I don't want to do multi-device, even if I'm doing Windows to start. So I would tend these days now to do FMX, especially for new projects. It just gives you all the possibility to not only do Windows, but Mac and beyond. If your customers or users all of a sudden say, gee, I'd like that app on, on a tablet running iOS or Android. So if uh, VCL, then uh, FMX uh, for those multi-device. Uh, why might I want to pick VCL, Stephen? Um, if you already have VCL code, uh, that's a good reason for doing a VCL for something. If you've got a whole body of existing reusable code that's VCL, you can actually do some tricks and there's some third-party tools for trying to mix the two. Uh, but if you're just modifying an existing app, you can always decide to have some parts of it using FMX and some parts VCL. And again, their utilities monkey mixer is one. Uh, we've shown how you can have FMX form in a DLL, for example, and use it from a VCL application. Um, yeah, there's a way to mix, even in C++, I'm at, you, again, you have to, you'll get this kind of warning about uh, the fit. I'm not sure about an ambiguity error, but I, it's been a while since I tried, so I'll try that again. But again, the best way is to, Put your FMX forms in a DLL on Windows, if it's Windows, and then call it from through interfaces uh, to the DLL from your VCL application.
that's probably the best way to make sure that that you can do it then there's a defined separation between the two but those are good comments and questions I'll uh, get caught up on the on the answer typing in the log uh, during the next session let me just check because I'm we're having a little technical difficulty with the next presentation file but I I have the the touch management with object Pascal that's working but I'm just trying to get the the C++ version let's see if it's showing up the one I had was corrupted before so yeah I don't see a working version okay um, if there are no other questions for now again Marco Cantu is blogging and our world tour for November December uh, Look on our website for the events calendar for the different cities and dates around the world. Uh, that tour is all focused on helping you move forward. So how to migrate VCL applications, how to enhance your VCL applications, how to use app tethering to maybe have an FMX app that talks with a VCL app. I think Brian was, was doing something. You, you drop the components in on the VCL side for app tethering and you drop them into the FMX side and they can work together. Uh, we have uh, videos and demos about app tethering and Al Manorino will be showing, he's doing talks in the C++ track and the Delphi track uh, showing app tethering. So look for that session for Al if you want to see how to mer mix and match through app tethering, either Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. Um, let's see, Al's talk is on Thursday at 11 o'clock uh, in the C++ track. It's app tethering for VCL FMX using Wi-Fi and Bluetooth with Al Manorino. So being able to use app tethering to keep that logical separation, but then you have two apps, of course. That's at 11 o'clock on Thursday. Uh, technical session 35. Al does a great job of showing all the cool stuff you can do in app tethering. All right. I think that's it for now. I'm going to stop this part of it and get back and get ready for the top of the hour. Let me get back to the slide deck. <laughs>